All right, this thing seems to be working. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I will not be talking about uh, nuclear anything. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about astrophysics, computational astrophysics, what I've done for my dissertation, and mostly give you a lot of pretty pictures and uh, uh, try to convey a few ideas. Uh, my collaborators, uh, my advisor Jack Burns at Colorado, plus a bunch of other partners in crime uh, across the country. So the main point of this talk and the main point of my research was to use cosmological simulations to study the thermal and non-thermal properties of clusters of galaxies. Uh, thermal being kind of normal particles, protons, they obey a, they're in a Maxwellian distribution. Non-thermal being relativistic particles. A galaxy cluster is the most massively bound, uh, bound, gravitationally bound object in the universe, meaning it's composed of many galaxies, which them, themselves are composed of many stars. They're 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 times the mass of our sun. They're first discovered uh, in visible wavelengths, and now we see them in X-ray wavelengths, infrared, uh, radio wavelengths. This is a, a beautiful image of a, a very massive cluster, where in the purple is diffuse X-ray emission coming from very hot electrons, 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 Kelvin. Uh, and in the, the optical, the white light are all the galaxies. So each of these are individual galaxies. So that gives you a kind of uh, idea of what the scale of these objects are. I'm particularly interested in the relationship between the thermal and non-thermal particles in a galaxy cluster. So here again, I'm showing you the X-ray in this bluish color here. But now I'm showing you uh, radio observations of the same cluster overlaid in red where this is thought to be the product of very relativistic electrons emitting synchrotron radiation and magnetic field. Uh, this is two megaparsecs long. That's astronomer speak for about 6.6 .6 million light years. These are extremely large, coherent structures that we see in our universe. And so the, 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 claim, the idea here is, how do we explain how this, this actually comes about? It all really boils down to three processes. The first one is gravitational collapse. This is the process of converting gravitational energy into kinetic and thermal energy. That's how these galaxy clusters form out of very small fluctuations in the early universe and slowly build up their very high temperature hot gas inside of them. To give you a better idea of this, this is a, a, a projection along a line of sight looking at a galaxy cluster forming over 10 billion years where red is very high density and, and bluish is low density. And so you see the, that this object forms very hierarchically, uh, forms two objects that then at the last stages merge together and send a, a big shock wave moving out to the left and right. So that's how gravitational collapse works. Small objects forming together into larger and larger objects as time goes on. The next piece you have to understand is something called shock acceleration. And so this is the, the process of turning shock kinetic energy into particle energy in relativistic electrons and ions. This basic process is, is uh, quite old at this point, uh, and it's the process of particles uh, reflecting off magnetic field inhomogeneities in the region around a shock where there's higher velocity over here and lower the velocity over here, and so on average, as these particles cross back and forth across the, the plane of the shock, they on average gain energy until they're relativistic enough to escape the shock and, and go radiate away their energy somewhere else. They radiate their energy away through a process called synchrotron emission. This is a fairly standard emission process where any relativistic charged particle uh, can, in a magnetic field of some strength will emit uh, radiation. Uh, it happens to be for these particular energies of particles and magnetic field strengths that they emit uh, in radio wavelengths, uh, which is why we see them observationally. And so if, when you combine those three things, what you end up is a picture like this where I'm now showing you the synchrotron radiation from one of my galaxy cluster simulations. And so you see time evolves from the upper left to the lower right, and you see that these uh, two uh, smaller clusters move along until they merge. And in this upper right-hand panel, the synchrotron emission ends up looking very, very similar to what we actually see observationally. And so this gives us an idea that uh, this, this thought of converting gravitational energy into kinetic energy of the shock 
converting that energy into the relativistic particle distribution, uh, which then radiate away their emission in synchrotron emission, all kind of hangs together. And so that's the basic process that I spent most of my time in grad school uh, studying, characterizing, and, and uh, trying to work backwards from what we see and the, the observational results that we get from our simulations, uh, combined with the observations to constrain things like the plasma physical parameters that are actually occurring in these massive objects that we cannot reproduce in a lab, right? So we want to know about shock acceleration efficiency, uh, magnetic field strength, number densities of the electrons and protons. So by combining those with observations, you can, you can try to pull that back out. Uh, now, to do this, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the, the tools that I use to do this. Uh, I'll just say that I'm one of many developers of these following two major code bases. They're both community developed and, and open source. The first one is called ENZO, which is an adaptive mesh refinement code, uh, primarily developed in the beginning for cosmological hydrodynamics. Uh, as I said, it's open source, openly developed. Uh, it's parallels in MPI. I'm kind of working on some open MP stuff. Uh, but the idea is that you want to simulate a very large volume of the universe, do it efficiently. Uh, and it turns out in the universe, there's a lot of empty space. So we optimize this by only focusing our resolution elements in the regions we care about. So where there's high density in a galaxy cluster, we, we lay down more grids, more resolution elements. Uh, this is adaptive mesh refinement, and it's used in many, many fields to capture the interesting parts of your simulations and, and not waste your resources somewhere else. The other code I used is a, a code called YT, which is a, a Python-based visualization and analysis toolkit. Uh, it was originally for AMR data sets, but it now does particle data sets, and it, it covers a wide range of many of the cosmological simulation codes in computational astrophysics at this point. Uh, this movie was another movie of a, of a galaxy cluster forming here. It's zoomed into a small region of the box. This guy's going to merge, and, and if you were to observe that in synchrotron radiation, it would have kind of similar patterns. Um, but the point is, all of my analysis goes through this, this Python package. And talk to me later if you have big data that you're interested in, not necessarily astrophysics. So on top of those, those base tools, I added a new physics module. Because what we want to know is how does this synchrotron radiation behave? How does it evolve? Uh, and up until this point, there haven't been many studies that look at the time evolution of this distribution function of, of electrons and protons in a galaxy cluster. You basically get snapshots that look, oh, if you, if you add up the entire amount of radiation from a, a set of particles accelerated the shock, you'd get this amount of radiation. But what we really want to know is, is how does this evolve in time, and how does this relate to other observables of galaxy cluster formation and evolution? So what I did was I added that ability to follow an aging cosmic ray electron and proton population. So you can have various acceleration mechanisms, injection mechanisms. Uh, uh, it advects around with the flow, and it can cool due to various uh, radiation mechanisms. The base idea here is you have some distribution function that describes the particles that depends uh, principally on, on the position, the momentum, and time. Now, if you actually want to solve these things, it's a bunch of uh, a kind of a messy equation, a Fokker-Planck uh, diffusion convection equation. And there's a bunch of terms relating to spatial diffusion and momentum diffusion, uh, cooling, compressive terms. Uh, in the environments in a galaxy cluster, you can cut out a few of these terms, and you get a reduced equation. Now, I packaged this all up, and, and one of the key things I learned during this fellowship is how to write better code. I'm not going to say it's good code, but it's better code. Uh, and so this is wrapped up in a C++ library that follows the momentum distribution of cosmic rays as they evolve. Uh, try to be extensible, try to have it very loosely coupled to the underlying ENZO code so that it could work with other, other codes in general. And so how it works is ENZO kind of solves the hydrodynamics. Uh, it then wraps a few things up and sends it over to CRT. It evolves it. It, it adds acceleration, incorporates losses, uh, and finally subcycles over very fast cooling electrons because you don't want to march your hydro along on, on time scales relevant for electron cooling. Uh, then it returns it to ENZO, and ENZO continues on its, on its merry way. And so the first application of this was a, a somewhat modest but a decently high-resolution single cluster simulation where 
had very good mass resolution and, and decent spatial resolution. Uh, it didn't use a ton of core hours, but I got it to scale because the cosmic rays are a little expensive to scale up to a couple, you know, about a thousand cores. Uh, and this is the, the, the density distribution again, just to remind you what the gas is generally doing in this vicinity. So remember, these two things are coming together, they merge here, and then it kind of settles down and nothing really happens at the end. So what I'm going to show you in the next slide is a movie describing the, uh, the synchrotron emission in this galaxy cluster simulation as it evolves in time uh, and so on. So in, shown in white-ish is the uh, kind of weak synchrotron emission, and reddish areas are very strong emissions. So you see this massive cosmic web that uh, builds up over time. Now what is going on is I'm changing the transfer function to zoom in on this, this inner portion where the radio emission is the strongest, because those are the regions we might be able to observe. So it zooms in, and eventually here it's, it's going to, uh, to evolve, but you see this kind of double-lobed structure that we see in observations all the time. And it's interesting to think about what you would interpret if you saw one of the things from, from the, a wrong angle, right, or a different angle. So then it evolves and the synchrotron cooling takes over and the electrons cool off very quickly. Your synchrotron emission dies out and it kind of disappears. But now the interesting question comes along, what if we were to build a better telescope? And so the idea here now is I now change the transfer function again to reveal that underlying uh, distribution of electrons to see what might be possible with next generation radio telescopes, which would be extremely interesting to map this giant cosmic web uh, over megaparsecs and millions of light years in, in distance. We can then uh, do some actual science with this type of simulation instead of just make pretty pictures uh, and follow along the, the time evolution of the, the synchrotron emission relative to things like what the, the peak density is, what the average temperature of the galaxy cluster is, other observables like something called a sunyaya zeldovich effect. Uh, and you can get interesting correlations, uh, and I'm not going to go into everything that you can determine from this because it's an it's a hour-long talk. Uh, but we're starting to dive in and see when we should expect to see this radio emission corresponding to other points in the galaxy cluster's evolution. So what we, we've kind of found from this is that uh, unexpectedly some of the, the lower energy cosmic rays stick around longer than we thought they would. Uh, and so people thought that they would, they would die out very quickly, but this might be very important for some of the very low frequency radio telescopes that are coming online right now. Um, we confirmed some earlier thoughts about how we, th uh, we think that the radio emission lags some of the enhancements on, in the other observational properties of galaxy clusters. Uh, we also confirmed that, that viewing angle is very important because the angle at which you view these objects unfortunately changes the opinion of an observational astronomer as to what these objects are. Um, uh, and finally, we found some, some interesting correlations. Uh, I want to talk uh, real quick about uh, a very, very recent CSGF impact for me. Uh, during my program of study, I took a high-performance scientific computing course. Uh, the class project dealt with building a parallel decomposition for AMR data sets that I wanted to use for, for volume rendering, which you can tell I've, I'm quite fond of. Uh, in 2011, this, this framework was incorporated into YT uh, to do the, the underlying volume rendering for the, the domain decomposition. And uh, fresh off the press today, uh, this wasn't my work, but I wrote the code to do it, uh, is the cover of Nature. So that was pretty cool. This was just an observational astronomer, picked up YT, took state-of-the-art observations with a, a, a telescope that's just coming online called ALMA, volume rendered it, made it on nature, I say success. Uh, so takeaways, uh, galaxy clusters are these great cosmological uh, astrophysical laboratories to do fun, fun plasma physics. Uh, there's some really cool stuff going on with cos uh, cosmic ray electrons and how they uh, evolve in time, how they relate to what we'll see with upcoming uh, telescopes. Uh, if I can express to you one uh, opinion from a soapbox, uh, develop community tools that are useful for more than just you, because it pays off in the end. 
Uh, and if you have data, talk to me about YT. Uh, thank you to everyone, specifically the DOE in, in all its facets. The CSGF program has been fantastic. Uh, all the other CSGFers in the room, it's been a blast the last couple of years, and hopefully that'll continue. Uh, thanks to Research Computing at Colorado for uh, giving some uh, computing time. And finally, thank you to the Krell. <laughs>